Thanks, Scott, and uh, much appreciated. And thanks to you and TIA for hosting uh, this event and this panel today. It's very interesting. I've learned a lot already. And uh, after today, Scott, I'm adding cybersecurity to my bio. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> thank you very much. We uh, And uh, good afternoon, everyone. We have a uh, panel of uh, real experts uh, on this issue today. Uh, we're thrilled to, to have them here. And uh, I'll just briefly uh, give a quick introduction, and then we're going to go through the panelists uh, to make uh, the, some uh, some remarks, and then we'll have some discussion uh, and, of course, questions. Uh, so uh, our first uh, speaker will be uh, Jim Hatipolu, uh, who's with uh, NHTSA. He's a division chief of the electronic systems uh, for research Nash and with NHTSA. Our second speaker will be Mike Camisa, who's the senior director of safety for the Association of Global Automakers. And uh, our uh, final speaker will be Masashi Ito, who's a researcher for the National Institute of Information and Communications Technology in Japan. Uh, and I, I welcome all of them. Thank you for, for participating with us today on a very interesting subject. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, and with that, uh, Jim, do you want to uh, yeah. take it away? Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, I work at NHTSA, and this is a very important topic for not only the agency, but the department. Uh, vehicle cybersecurity is very important because it's intertwined with technology-driven safety enhancement that the department sees in these innovative technologies. There are still 32,675 fatalities that were observed on the roads in 2014. And technologies, advanced forms of automation have the potential to address most of these challenges and fatalities and injuries. Uh, along with these technologies, they'll come with certain cyber vulnerabilities. Uh, so we, first of all, want to make sure that the safety assurance of uh, vehicles are addressed. Uh, and security comes into play, particularly in our domain of interest, is when security can translate into a safety critical out outcome. For that, we, are, we have a research program where we try to kind of analyze. It's actually a very um, complex topic that requires the involvement from many parties, uh, stakeholders, industry, the suppliers, you have the wireless carriers. When you start going in the cyber domain, opportunities for safety enhancements are great, but the number of people, number of technologies, everyone involved to get a very complex system deliver on its safety promise becomes a challenge. Uh, but that challenge is something that the industry collectively have to overcome because we cannot go back and say, okay, get rid of all the technolog technological innovations so that we can get rid of the cyber risks. Because if you go back, that's one way to do it is take all these electronics out of the car. But that is not the solution. So from our standpoint, we have a very engaged uh, program that we work very closely work with the industry to make sure that the safety promise of these advanced technologies are realized. And cybersecurity does not become a major, I guess, burden or a um, barrier to get there fast, fast enough. And I think that I just want to convey the message that you cannot think about addressing cybersecurity without thinking about what it might do to these advanced technologies that have immense safety enhancement potential. Jim, thank you. Mike? So, um, yeah, I w agree with, uh, with Jim on the, the great safety uh, potential, uh, and other panelists uh, today have, uh, have mentioned that too, that with the new connectivity and the new applications that are available as we bring the car into the Internet of Things, um, the safety, mobility, efficiency benefits are huge. And so it's important um, to get that right and to get the trust of the customers in this, uh, this new technology. Um, we used to think of, of um, uh, quality as just making sure the thing go, works right. Then we started to look at quality as being a little bit better. What features do we have that, that, uh, that we like? And now I think the next level of quality that we're addressing as an industry is the, the consumer's trust. Uh, and so in the cybersecurity uh, area, it comes, uh, there's three things that we as an industry are working on to try to um, build that trust and uh, demonstrate that we are working hard in this area. 
Um, we'll talk about this probably a little bit more as we go into the discussion, but we've uh, established an auto industry uh, ISAC, uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center, um, which is a model that's been used in some other uh, industries as well. Um, we're currently also working on, uh, on best practices for cybersecurity in the uh, automotive environment. And um, we've also established uh, with our, our members uh, and the broader auto industry uh, a set of privacy principles to show the customers that the, the data that they have in the vehicle is protected. Um, I think this is a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great topic. It's a, a great time we have here with all the potential benefits. Um, I've been, you know, the panel discussions have been fascinating. Um, we're moving towards uh, automation. We're moving towards connectivity beyond just bringing your phone into the car or having, you know, having Bluetooth or having some sort of a hotspot to the V2V and how are we using that. Um, and so cybersecurity becomes a very big issue, uh, as I said, but it's also an issue that I think is, uh, you know, surmountable um, with, you know, leveling expectations uh, between the government, the industry and the consumers so they know what, what's really going on. I mean, people are, people are using devices in all parts of their lives today. And um, the car is another, another, another one of those is being added. And I think, um, you know, we can continue to build the trust that, that the customers expect. Jim, thank you. Ito-san. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Ito from NICT Japan. And um, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, um, NICT is the National Institute of Information and Communications Technology in Japan which is under the umbrella of uh, Ministry of Information, Internal Affairs and Communication. And NICT is, uh, uh, NICT has two functions, two main functions. One is the research and the development by NICT itself and uh, uh, budgeting, uh, funding budgets to other organizations like uh, domestic and overseas companies. And as for the research and the development by NICT itself, we have very uh, wide range of research topics, including uh, space weather forecasting and uh, photonic communication technology, wireless tech communication technology, and the Japanese standard time, JST, is also generated and distributed by NICT. And of course, uh, they, uh, NICT has the research topic of cybersecurity and I belong to uh, the Division of Cybersecurity for more than 10 years and uh, uh, focusing on the research and development of cybersecurity technologies. And uh, in our, our group, uh, we are uh, developing the cybersecurity technology for more than 10 years. And during the last 10 years, the cybersecurity, uh, the technology of cyber attacks is getting sophisticated more and more in these 10 years. So especially in these several years, uh, the, the one of the most uh, serious problem in cybersecurity uh, field is uh, APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, which is focusing on uh, the attacking to the, the, the uh, certain organization certain organization and the attackers spend very long time to compromise the organization in order to get the important information of the, uh, the, those companies. And for this APT attack, the attackers often use very uh, old type, old type attacking technologies like um, the malicious email, malicious website, even they use uh, the malicious bad USB memories to compromise uh, the targeted organizations. So uh, the attacking technology and uh, so the, in cybersecurity field, the attacking technology is getting sophisticated more and more. And uh, in and also uh, in these years, I am involved in the the research of the cybersecurity for automotive. And uh, we found that uh, most of the such uh, cyber attack technique can be easily applied to for, for automotive. So uh, we need to fight against uh, this, uh, the, this kind of problem. And uh, 
that's that's why we are doing the research for such kind of technologies and also I'm involved in the international standardization of such kind of uh, cybersecurity technology for automotive. So uh, maybe later I will introduce some uh, my activities regarding the international standardization of, for automotive uh, involved in uh, ITOT. So, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ito-san. Uh, so uh, I have a couple of areas I'd like to ask the panelists if they could uh, speak to. Um, and uh, starting with uh, a fundamental question, um, what, what do we actually mean when we talk about cybersecurity in an automotive context? I mean, what, what is the threat uh, that we're talking about? Uh, can, can you speak to that? Are we talking about uh, accessing cars over the air? Are we talking about some other form of hacking? And if so, uh, has that happened? Do we know of instances where that's happened either in, in, in a controlled environment or outside of that? And uh, can you speak to uh, any, uh, of any knowledge that you may have over uh, known threats? Uh, and I, I think we heard a little bit just then. Uh, but I'd be interested uh, if we could have a little bit of a discussion in that area. So do you want to start? I'll start just at a high level. I mean, there's, the, there's, there's threats that require physical access and threats that can be done over the air. Mm -hmm. um, and so the entry points to the vehicle um, you know, include uh, your phone coming in, the Bluetooth connection, um, any other communications um, connections to the vehicle. Um, and then there's also the physical access like the OBD2 port, um, which provides a place to, to plug in and get actual physical access to, mm -hmm. to the vehicle. Um, most of what we've seen, we, there's research, there's hackathons where, you know, industry and, and uh, the, I mean, auto industry specifically, but also others in related industries are, you know, constantly looking for these, probing these things, trying to identify problems ahead of time and, and address them in the in their designs. Yeah, let me add that, like, at NHTSA, this is a multi-pronged objectives. One is to understand what is going on out there. We have actually established the Applied Cybersecurity Lab in our Ohio facility. We're one of the unique federal agencies that has that capability. And over there, we monitor actually the types of demonstrated cases and replicate and advance them in cases. Mm -hmm. So there are demonstrated cases, mostly through physical access. But in lately, in the in June of 2015, there was one case which they needed physical access early on to reverse engineer. But after it was you know, reverse engineer, there was a threat that purely wirelessly. Uh, that could be a threat. And we were able to replicate basically uh, claims. And we worked with the researchers to make sure that we understood the kind of concern. And it, we decided that it, that particular case had a safety critical concern. So it ended up being the first cybersecurity recall uh, that led to the first cybersecurity related recall uh, in the US. Now, we are very vigilant in assessing these demonstrated cases and will remain that way. Um, but as Mike said, there are many ways to parse into threat vectors in a car. You have physical access, short range wireless, and the, the physical access could be par parsed into, do you need inside physical access or do you need external physical access? And then short range, is it really, really short or is it mid range? And then you have obviously anywhere in the US to a car, that's obviously a long range, and all of them have different implied threat mm, sensitivities, let's say. And it, it is not the only factor, though, because you, you have to have a cyber physical control or a, and a cyber attack point, and then the middle is the, there's a vulnerability. So you have to have an attack point, you need to have a vulnerability, and a, you need for safety critical to manifest itself, you need to have a cyber physical controls. And all of them have to come together for a cyber concern in a car to result in a safety critical issue or a concern. So all the architectures are different in the cars. We continue to evaluate. And the solutions to protect them are different. But um, in general, when you parse these in that manner and look at other factors, what is it the worst case scenario that you can implement you start getting an image of what is really, really important. Uh, 
and what is maybe not so important, but the middle ground, how do you make that decision in a demonstrated case is, is not trivial, but that's something that we are at the agency working with our stakeholders so that we will have better clarity. Having said that, is it possible? Uh, I think it is demonstrated that it is possible. We are not aware of any uh, cyber attack that resulted in a physical or a safety critical issue in the real world. Uh, demonstrated cases have been in the research setting and the researchers were thankfully white hat researchers that shared this information with us and the you know, OEMs and everyone responsibly. Um, but it is possible. Uh, I think that's shown. The question is uh, right now, what can you do going forward uh, to mitigate some of these um, vulnerabilities? Uh, and we actually asked, we had a federal register notice that we published in 2014 and asked the public whether anybody knew of a case. Because our research didn't show that there was any case. But we asked the public and public concurred that nobody actually knew of an actual like, cyber event on the real world that resulted in a safety critical concern. Uh, but that doesn't give us com you know, like comfort that you need to be proactive in this domain. Uh, obviously, we continue to monitor and advance our capabilities to look into this uh, challenge. Um, but it is, it's demonstrated, not in real world, but that doesn't make us stop looking for, for solutions that could address this um, going forward. If I might jump in a little bit too on that, um, Chem from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration rightly pointed out their, their work in the safety critical area, but uh, the automakers are also concerned about the privacy and the protection of the consumer's data as well. Right. So we have to, to not only deal with um, protecting the vehicle system, safety systems, but also the data that's brought into the car or available to the car. And so, um, you know, with our ISAC and our best practices, you know, those are things, and our privacy principles, we're addressing that element as well. Okay, and, and I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit more about the ISAC uh, in, in just a few minutes. Uh, Ito-san, do you have yeah, a comment? Uh, same as the previous comment. Uh, uh -huh. I also uh, think about, I think, uh, the such kind of demonstration uh -huh. is very, uh, yeah, we need such uh, demonstration. <laughs> I mean, uh, in cybersecurity field, uh, there are kind of penetration testing to uh, the s s computing systems in order to find out the vulnerability of uh, systems. So, um, of course, such kind of testing is uh, done under the, uh, the consensus of the attacker and the uh, uh, service provider and uh, uh, the users. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in order to find out the vulnerability, um, it's very important. Such, such kind of research is very important, I think. So would, would you all agree with the statement that we seem to be ahead of the hackers? Do we know? Is that a fair question? <laughs> I, don't, I don't care if it is, but I... I mean, we, we're, we're doing our best to, to, to address things as quickly as possible. We don't want to you know, wave red flags in front of anyone yeah. and, uh, and, and claim victory. Uh, I think it's a kind of an of a iterative process that's always going to be, uh, you know, we're always going to be developing the next thing and they're always going to be developing the next thing. So um, I think, I think, we're, I think we're moving quickly and mm -hmm. doing a good job. I concur that the cybersecurity is a realm where things change very frequently. You may have the state of art at any given time that is above what the state of art of, I guess, hacking side, mm -hmm. but that moves, so you have to move with it. So there's no claiming of a victory, probably, in a sense, as Mike said. So we need to make sure that there are mechanisms in place, such as automotive ISAC, where mm -hmm. stakeholders can very expeditiously exchange critical information, not only on the vulnerabilities, but also how to can address them going forward. And these are elements, I mean, understanding the threat side, understanding these uh, sharing of information to expeditiously address them. And then I agree with Eto that white hat hackers are a significant stakeholder in this, mm -hmm. uh, which they contribute in manners that I don't think many other stakeholders are able. And we need to make sure that we leverage everybody's collective wisdom mm -hmm. and uh, I guess intelligence in this domain to advance the industry towards, you know, uh, uh, continuously improving cybersecurity environment. 
Yeah. Well, for, for what it's worth, you know, we, we looked for cases, uh, litigation over uh, hacking cases in, uh, in the automobile. Uh, and all we found were uh, a couple of class actions filed, one coming out of the uh, Jeep Cherokee report from the summer, uh, that were uh, actions brought on concerns that the vehicle was vulnerable, not that there had actually been an actual uh, criminal hacking attempt. Uh, so that, the, that, that research seems to bear out, uh, seems to agree with what, what you've seen as well. Um, but uh, w so what, what measures, I mean, we've talked about the ISAC. I mean, what other measures are, are, is, is industry uh, and government uh, undertaking to, to prepare for this and to protect uh, the, those uh, uh, protect the uh, the public from uh, the, the effects of a hack. Yeah, let me um, since we have been talking about the ISAC in, in in a little bit here and there in each question. Let me talk about that a little bit more detail now. Um, now the information sharing analysis center model has been used in in other industries such as financial services, uh, oil and natural gas, aviation, um, and it's a model we looked at as a way of addressing um, uh, cybersecurity in the automotive uh, environment as well and. Um, we took some time as an industry um, to work through a process of evaluating and learning lesson, lessons learned from the other industries and um, developed an outline for our ISAC. Um, and we've put that into place and it's, uh, we've got the ISAC up and running now where um, it's, you take steps slowly, uh, uh, deliberately, and you continue to grow it. It's, um, it's something where you have to build a, a, a trust among the members and so we're starting sort of with the inner circle of the automakers, and then it will slowly grow and include um, suppliers and, and, and other stakeholders. Um, it's a centralized uh, place for people to bring cyber threat information, share it, uh, analyze it, look at ways to respond. Um, I think there was a couple of things that uh, Mr. Eto said uh, about um, you know persistent threat uh, and the penetration testing, and that's 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 a technique not only used by the white hat hackers but others uh, too. And so, uh, to the extent that uh, uh, you can be aware of that going on, um, that helps you protect yourself. So when a a, a company or vehicle manufacturer uh, is aware that somebody's been probing their system. Um, by sharing that information with everyone else, they can begin to look and see if are, are they protected, uh, is, are they having the similar um, uh, similar threat um, uh, approached on their vehicles. Um, so you can you can speed uh, knowledge, you can speed your response to it, um, and then you can also, as we get more sophisticated, uh, maybe even get into the predictive nature of this and, and to figuring out where things may be coming coming from next. Um, the ISAC is, a, is, a, is an important model because um, it does allow competitors to get together and share this information uh, confidentially and anonymously um, and, and, and address it uh, uh, you know, in, a, in a reasonable uh, manner uh, and, and again sharing information. That, that can be difficult among competitors for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, Senator Peters mentioned uh, mm -hmm. you know, that there was protections to, to, right. to, the, uh, to the competitors in, in the ISAC environment, and, and we appreciate those. Uh, and I think it's, um, it's something, like I said, it's been effective in, in other industries, and, and I think we, we see it as being something um, very helpful uh, uh, for, for us moving forward. I don't, Chem, do you want to? No, that, that's something our administration very strongly supports and encourage the industry to not only set it up, but actively participate and we continue to be on, on, on the same message. This is very critical. It has been proven in other industries, as Mike said. There is, we don't, industry, the, you know, the industry needs to take credit for the fact that this is, I think, the first ISAC that's uh, kind of established without a triggering, like, big, large-scale, um, event like in the retail sector like the target all of them have been voluntary versions have been uh, established because something happened and everybody decided that's what we must but the automotive industry proactively started looking at it and decided that they wanted to pursue it so there's credit is you know where it's due it's it's something that's very important and as mike said as going forward we think there's benefit for other stakeholders like suppliers and the wireless communicate there a number of stakeholders out there that would probably not only benefit from this, but also can contribute to the information sharing. Uh, and 
we understand that the ISAC uh, members are working towards that, but uh, we also understand that it needs to start functioning in a smaller scale. In other ways, the industry is working, and recently SA International, I think J3061, which is a best practices or recommended practices on the vehicle cybersecurity that they almost ready to be completing. We, we have a liaison to that working group, and they, there was a webinar where they announced that early in next year, they plan to publish it as the world's first um, cybersecurity best practices, I think, document. Uh, that is encouraging. We have been looking at elements of, uh, we have an inside information I think we have been monitoring because we think voluntary standards are a key uh, part of going forward, keeping these uh, standards fresh. Uh, the government and regulation, even though we are investigating whether, you know, how we can help, in this realm things change so fast that when the regulation is a slow cycle process, it may not, it more than likely will not be the only answer and there is a role for a lot of different activities and that means voluntary standards and also best practices to follow these standards, adopt them and there are different parts of it. It's the path of the minimum resistance. The cars today are the target for voluntary, you know, like hacking. But once you start securing it, I, mean, I will tie it to what Ethos mm -hmm. says, it will be the next, you know, least resistant. Maybe it's the maintenance facilities or areas where you can actually get access to the cars. And maybe it is the manufacturer or, or manufacturing areas, dealers or OEMs or suppliers. So we have a holistic approach in looking at there could be best practices in various different aspects of this. Um, of course, there are elements of serviceability uh, concerns or challenges come into play. If you secure the car really well, uh, will anybody be able to secure their own car? There's a right to repair act and all, all that come into play. Is it security or maintainability? Uh, can you not come up with a solution that can provide both? Um, so there are means to incorporate various different objectives, but safety critical systems from our standpoint, how you secure it, how you validate it, and how you maintain it through the life cycle of the vehicle, and how you design these features, not tag on after the system is built. And then cybersecurity is a life cycle process. And encouraging the industry to adopt this in conjunction with how they build the cars. Uh, and we meet with, privately, uh, pretty much all the OEMs, tier ones, we don't stop there. We go aviation as well as you know other industries where similar transformation or work is uh, ongoing to learn from their uh, suppliers and OEMs how they are doing this um, and find the similarities, best practices. There is a lot of worldwide effort going on in this. Uh, so we we actually called for a cybersecurity roundtable in January 19, 2016, here in DC where we invited all the automotive stakeholders. And we will be discussing the availability and I guess if of all you know, sufficient and clear guidance for the OEMs to you know, work towards improving their cybersecurity posture in their cars. And if there are gaps to identify them, if there are roadblocks to adopting them, identify them so that collectively and when I mean collectively, it's not us and the industry, it's us industry. We have a lot of federal partners that we work very closely with who have significant experience in this domain, but also interest to help. And we would like to identify how we can collectively help the industry move to where they need to be or that they want to be. Uh, but there's a lot of effort uh, in this domain. Um, and industry is taking a major part of the initiative to, you know, through these uh, standard setting organizations, as well as the interactions with us. Um, we also have a decision point in next year in our priority plan uh, as NHTSA. Uh, and that decision point could be based on everything we have collected so far, um, or every artifact we have seen from our research, as well as industry, uh, best practices, everything else whether it's, uh, and we will ask similar questions uh, solicited from uh, uh, stakeholders as well. What is the regulatory or policy you know, best paths for NHTSA 
to help with the you know, with the process. Mm -hmm. um, I'll leave it at that and give opportunity for maybe Eto or others to chime in. But there is research, there is desires to get as an industry, as a whole entire stakeholder group, to get to a point. And there are already many pieces are there. It's just identify, make sure that. Uh, we can close the gaps wherever they, they may be. Uh, those activities are on their way. All right, thank you. Uh, you know, you, uh, there have been some discussion of standards, and I'd like uh, to ask Ito-san if he can speak to what's going on in the international standards area and okay. the work that he's been involved with. I think. So as for the security, cybersecurity for automotives, um, before uh, going in detail of the automotive or cybersecurity, uh, I would like to introduce some experience of uh, the cybersecurity uh, in our research activities. And uh, in, uh, in NRCT, we have now uh, conducting a research project called NICTAR. And in this project, we are <coughs> deploying our sensor to monitor cyber attacks on the internet to uh, other cooperative organizations and capture uh, the monitoring unused IP address and the cyber attacks. And in this project, uh, we uh, observe many attacks, cyber attacks from other countries to our, uh, our monitor, monitoring environment. And I will show you uh, our visualization animation, so a movie. So uh, this is the uh, real cyber attacks observed several years ago. And uh, in this video, there are many locations to Japan from many countries. And in this animation, each rocket indicates packet to infect PCs inside our environment. And there are many uh, attacking packets flying uh, to Japan, but uh, most of the source of these attacks uh, computers, just the legitimate computers infected by malware. And uh, the users of these, those computers are unaware about the infection and uh, the, the, the participating in the such kind of campaign, attack campaign. So uh, they have no intention to attack Japan. But, uh, but uh, they are participating in this kind of attacks. So, this is the statis statistic information of the uh, observed attacks packets. And uh, you can see the graph on the bottom of this slide. And uh, there are many uh, attacks. And uh, the number of packets is increasing year by year. But uh, from 2013 to 2014, the number of observed attacking packets is increased almost double. This is uh, also uh, we checked why this, uh, the number of packets were so increased. And uh, we checked the source of each attacking host. And we found that uh, most of the attack are, attacks are coming from these IoT devices. This is the, uh, the, the, the <coughs> screen of the uh, broadband routers and the Network, we have cameras in the network attached to storage and so on. Mm. So these IoT devices are infected by malware and participating attack campaign to expand their infections. So uh, we checked uh, the specific devices uh, on the source side, and we found that uh, there are many attackers in infected. Uh, computers like routers and antennas, even the food processing machine is attacking to our environment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, as you know, the connected vehicles are not exception of this kind of uh, attacks. That means the uh, network, the connected vehicle also might be, might have the vulnerable open port number to be exploited by remote attackers. So uh, this is uh, the, the example of the 
deep Cherokee that has uh, discussed before. So this activity was conducted by two researchers, and they demonstrated of attacks to Jeep Cherokee of using steering wheel, brake, and accelerator running on the highway. Maybe uh, most of you all here already know about this. So, so um, according to these knowledge, we have uh, doing some international standardization activities in IDUT. So that is the secure software update capability for ITS communications devices. We are developing this kind of uh, this uh, recommendation in ITUT. So uh, this is the, the information of the standard the ITUT recommendation. So secure software update capability for IT communications devices X ITS sec one, whose prop the purpose is to provide common methods to update the software by a secure procedure, including security controls and the protocol definition. And in this recommendation, we have uh, defined some security controls to protect automotive uh, uh, the vehicles. When automo uh, the vehicles try to update the software inside the software of ECUs inside the vehicle, uh, they, 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 the, uh, the vehicle needs to protect its, the procedure of the update procedure. So uh, in this procedure, uh, we recommend that uh, each vehicle needs to implement this kind of techniques, include, including message verification, trusted boots of ECUs, authentication of communication entities, message filtering, and fault tolerance of the procedure. So based on this, uh, definition, uh, we have def also defined the protocol, the procedure of software updating. So in this procedure, there's a the diag diagnose phase, and the update phase, update check phase, update phase, and the update report phase, and so on. So, uh, and we also uh, defined the specific uh, message format for each message of the software updating procedure like this. And uh, this the message is uh, expressed by XML, XML format like this. So uh, now uh, we are developing uh, this recommendation in ITUT. And uh, we also collaborating with other international standard SDOs, including Trusted TCG, Trusted Computing Group, and Etsy. And also ITUT is collaborate, the CITS, through the CITS collaboration on ITS, uh, we are now collaborating with car manufacturers and the suppliers. So uh, this is the current status of this recommendation. So uh, now the draft recommendation have achieved a certain level of quality. So uh, now we are requesting for comments to other um, automotive industries. And uh, as a future step, in the January, next January, uh, the, we are going to have the interim meeting in Seoul. And at this meeting, uh, we are going to make disposition of comments from automotive industries, and they're going to finalize the recommendation at the next March, in the meeting at Geneva. So this is the current status of the so yeah, this is the uh, that's of our recommendation, uh, the standardization activity. Interesting, thank you. Uh, and I would, uh, I'm going to excuse Jim from the next question that I have, uh, but before, I, I'd like before I, we go, I, there, actually, can I add? Oh. yeah, we'd like to pick up on that. I think. Yes, please. <coughs> you want to go first? Or? Uh, yeah, over the air updates and firmware updates and the cybersecurity associated with them is a research area of very important research area for us. We actually initiated research in that topic area as well. And Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology Director has also initiated research on the same in collaboration with us. So understanding the security posture and how over-the-air updates in general, but 
I guess is specifically, but also firmware updates. How can they be for automotive applications? Can be secured, validated, verified. All of that is part of a research project. Uh, that's a collective research project right now. A and I wanted to highlight that there is a lot of. Uh, that's a very important topic. Thanks for bringing up and you know, reminding me. But that is something that the agency, as well as the broader federal government, is really looking at right now. And, and I wanted to pick up on the thread that connected the two comments uh, from Chem and from Etosan about standards and regulations and how we, mm -hmm. how we incorporate that into the um, cybersecurity uh, environment. And one of the things that we have to do, and I think everyone recognizes, is be flexible that the, uh, the attacks are, are evolving, they're coming from different places, and, and uh, you know, we put up a barrier, they're going to look for a new way in. Um, and so we, we can't just put something down in place and say we've got it, and we can't take a long time to uh, address a new emerging threat. So with, uh, I think it's something uh, you mentioned about uh, cyber, somebody, uh, we got, there's a balance here, and, and you know, regulatory or standards things um, you know, they, they have the potential to be a roadmap for the hackers because if everybody does it exactly the same way, it gives them a way, a way to follow. Um, they also have the potential to be a roadblock for the cyber security of, of trying to adapt and respond to new threats. So you have to find the right balance there. And we think that the best practices approach and the, the industry standards right now is the way to go um, as we work uh, co collaboratively um, with, with the government and other, uh, other industries to try to come up with with those uh, standards and best practices. Thank you. I think you actually answered the question I was going to ask, which which was, does anyone believe that there's a need for government uh, active regulation or adoption of uh, new laws to uh, to deal with this emerging threat? Mm -hmm. And as I said, I'm going to excuse Jim from that, given his government role. Ito-san, you too, if you wish to. So I think I jumped yeah, on, thank you on that answered. question a, a, so, yeah, a, little, a um, little bit ahead. So, um, but and and so I think that you know we are working with government. There's yeah. certainly a role to work with government and researchers together on, on this. Yeah. What about a role, of, uh, a kind of a public-private partnership or a pr uh, private manager uh, to uh, to deal with issues? I mean, as you indicated, it's very hard to deal with a, a, a dynamic. Uh, evolving constant threat like cybersecurity with laws enacted at one point in time or even standards adopted at one point in time. And we, uh, you know, the standards process and the legal process uh, obviously uh, it can, can take a while to, to work its way through. Uh, what about uh, uh, a, uh, someone, a third party authorized to manage the process or the ISAC, for example? I mean, is it possible they could take a more functional role. Uh, I think the I, you know, the ISAC is. Uh, we don't want to overstretch them beyond their. Uh, you know, we want them focused on on a core set of functions, mm -hmm. which is the information sharing and analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is, like I said, there is a role to work with government and government to work with mm -hmm. industry. Um, there's been, um, as, as Chen mentioned, they've got their their roundtables uh, coming up, and uh, um, there's also been work at the uh, NIST, uh, National mm -hmm. Institute of Standards and Technology, um, and their uh, their framework, which mm -hmm. which many industries are are, are looking to apply. Um, so there are, there are a lot of venues uh, where this is being uh, being discussed. Um, it's it's a bit of a challenge because tr trying to keep track of all of those entities. I know Chem uh, and probably Etosan in, in Japan as well. That we we've, we've got our own. Uh, uh, within our country, and then there's a whole set of international uh, activities uh, undergoing. So we want to we, we want to learn from each other, and we don't want to duplicate uh, the efforts as well. So, um, in answer to your question as best I can, I think that, that there is a role for working together. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a formalized role for for something as you described, though. Mm -hmm. well, Bob, if I may, I think it's relevant to what you said, which is there's role for improving security. But our approach is to have layered approach, and that's, I think, very consistent. Like, you have to have layers. You can't just have one security and say, I'm done. You have to lower the uh, probability of success. But regardless of how many layers you put, I think if there's enough time, will, and money, it seems like all of the levels could be bypassed. So from our standpoint, the resilience of safety critical systems is very important. If you assume all security is bypassed, safety critical functions of the car 
of the vehicle, and the driver's ability to still manage drivability of the car is an important topic that needs to, I mean, that's part of the research. Can you design architectures in a manner that some of that, I mean, there are a lot of safety critical, safety relevant, pretty much everything on a car, even though it's a little further away from safety criticality, has, you can make a case for a safety relevancy. Now, not all of them may necessarily uh, have to be secured to the same degree, but safety critical, steering, braking, um, you know, throttle, maybe battery controls, those things are very essential. If security layers are bypassed, then the driver's ability to, like our position is that you need to have layers of uh, protection, but safety critical systems should need to, may need to be resilient even if all security layers are uh, bypassed. And there are ways to look at the, that resiliency and how you go about designing cars in the future that might be, uh, that might provide for that. And many of the cars today actually may have that functionality or some of them if not all of those safety So um, in terms of Isaac, in Japan, uh, we have uh, not auto automotive Isaac, but uh, we have telecom Isaac that is organized by telecom operators. And uh, in telecom Isaac in Japan, uh, they are uh, sharing the many informations, including best practice of cyber security. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, I think it's, uh, work, working very well in Japan, and they have succeeded to reduce the number of infected PCs in, in Japan. So uh, such kind of uh, framework, Isaac, is very effective, I think. So if, uh, so in terms of cybersecurity for automotive, I, I think the Isaac sharing information framework is very effect might be effective. Thank you. Uh, I've got one more uh, question that I want to uh, ask our audience uh, if they have questions for you. Uh, I, I noted the uh, article that you had uh, excerpted uh, regarding the Jeep um, hack and uh, the press on that. What mechanisms are available to communicate with the public to, to give them some assurance that uh, when they see articles like that, um, that it doesn't become a, just a, a roadblock to progress uh, for the industry. I mean, are, are people uh, kind of writing good articles? I mean, how are, how, are, how is that being handled? Well, that's part of as I as I opened with about the trust of the consumers, and yeah. and sometimes you know the, there's a little bit of sensationalism involved in some of this. It's you know it's a very uh, exciting uh, visual, um, but. Uh, you know, the reality is, is, is uh, as Chem said from their, their analysis of uh, comments, that, uh, you know, the reality of it is not, this is not something that's happening in, in real world incidents, it's mm -hmm. in, the, in the labs, um, that we, we, we do want to let the public know that we are designing these vehicles with security in mind. We are taking steps to um, identify potential threats and vulnerabilities um, even after the product's out through the ISAC. And we're working on on best practices um, that could be used throughout the industry and through the um, stakeholder group supplier chain, et cetera, that interact with the industry and with the vehicle. Uh, it's the full spectrum of I guess, stakeholders have different roles in potentially educating the public. Most average drivers would not know what cyber attack is on a car. Mm -hmm. Um, and they shouldn't. I mean, that's not what probably they need to be thinking through. Uh, so the car, there's an expectation that it's safe, free of unreasonable safety risks. And cybersecurity and its relevance to what safety critical outcomes it may result has to be taken care of. So, and then from there on, there are means by which the OE, you know, manufacturers can continue to uh, educate, just like other industries have passed through these paths. Uh, in the cyber physical world, it's uh, like there are slightly you know, different outcomes that are possible, so it needs to be taken care of in different ways. But uh, we need to learn from other industries, and the OEMs are already uh, doing work on this domain. Uh, it, there's no one simple answer to that question. I think it needs to evolve. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, questions from our audience? 
understand? Um, this is an online question um, for some. Can uh, the NHTSA officially speak to when the agency is going to release next phase of AV policy guidelines? Is DOT on track to release by the end of the year? Uh, I don't have a comment. It's an automated vehicle uh, related topic, but I think if it's cybersecurity, I'd be more than happy to <laughs> answer. Yeah, it, it, it just I'm not prepared to answer that question. Thank you. I have another question from the online streaming. Uh, will the automotive industry be able to address the question of cybersecurity to the satisfaction of the public and policymakers, or will regulation be needed? Yeah, and I think uh, you know we're 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 addressing it now, um, and and it's important to the, to us that our customers trust us and understand what we're doing, and also policymakers and regulators. Um, we have you know we have shared interest um, in keeping the driving public safe as well as getting this new technology out there. I mean, we're we're seeing um, uh, NHTSA is getting ready to announce their their vehicle to vehicle NPRM soon. Um, we've seen uh, the the DOT uh, with their Smart Cities Challenge, trying to put the technology, the communications out uh, in the in the city and create the environment for the vehicle to operate in. Um, we're talking about connecting it, not just vehicles to infrastructure, but also to pedestrians, cyclists, and other things. Um, we're seeing federal money um, in in uh, uh, the, the recently passed highway bill um, towards uh, communication uh, projects. Uh, so we all are seeing this huge benefit for the public um, in uh, the safety and mobility uh, and efficiency. And so I think we do have a shared interest. So uh, I think we're working together with policymakers and regulators to try to address that. Um, Michael and Sam, this is a, maybe a simple question, but probably not. Um, not a so as answer. I look at as I look at the world of uh, security and cybersecurity and um, Kind of and compartmentalize it. I mean, you've obviously got physical access. Then you're working on um, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, the security system there, which is which is different. Then you're dealing with community, uh, normal communications uh, within a vehicle, which are to the cloud, which are over you know other other modes of communications that are coming in and infotainment and then um, and uh, in telematics. Then you've got autonomous vehicles, which, again, have a completely different uh, communications protocol, communications methodology, com different vulnerabilities. And now we're moving um, very quickly into over-the-air updates of, of um, operational and security in, in systems that give you access in different ways. How do you prioritize these different um, these different uh, security vulnerabilities and where where are we most vulnerable and where should we be focusing most of our attention? Do we have a couple of hours? <laughs> um, I mean, from our standpoint, we have a, a clear prioritization process where we look at where the most immediate, uh, you know, best bang for the buck, which is, you know, there are certain commonalities across all of that. And we are working towards that with research programs as well as working with the industry. Uh, and that those need to be taken care of. Now, when you go in different aspects, we have aspirations to do additional research. Example is automated vehicles you brought up. When you take the driver out, uh, we would like to explore in, with more specific research whether if the driver is out of the loop as a backup, whether from cybersecurity, um, I guess, protection standpoint, the level of cybersecurity protection is necessary, that might be necessary, is different or similar. Because in most cases, like driver, when they are driving a car, it provides a really good backup when things are hacked, if they can still apply the brakes, versus whether if they can counter the steering. When you lose that, uh, the integrity of the, I guess, cyber, of the entire system may have to be looked at in a different way. Now, we don't know, but that's a research project that we would like to explore. However, all the things we're doing now will more than likely apply to automated vehicles, but automated vehicles may have unique, I guess, cybersecurity assessments that we may have to look at in more depth. 
I'm talking about more on the self-driving mode part of the automated, because some of them are intermediate, they're shared, you may still have the driver, but things change as, as that uh, driving authorities given to the cars. Um, from a connectivity standpoint, you know, one difference for B2B regulation is a, is a concentration for a mandated technology. When a technology is mandated versus if it's a voluntary, we have different requirements that we follow uh, that include um, you know, privacy impacts assessment. We also look at cybersecurity aspects and the security measures in there uh, with more, uh, I guess, um, in, in many more different ways. Uh, cybersecurity and security are not the same thing as you mentioned. Security is a kind of measure that can help reduce the likelihood of cybersecurity. But we have specific research that we are about to start and want to do on the V2V cybersecurity side, uh, learning from some of our federal counterparts um, to do how, how to approach that and make sure that there is good confidence in. Uh, in how to securely uh, secure, I guess, the security communication interfaces. Uh, because it's a regulated uh, you know, communication path into the vehicle and the security architecture is part of the regulation, we would like to make sure that those are uh, done with good safety, you know, security assurance. But once, it's, it's also the same because it's a pathway into the car. And when you talk about safety critical, it's the connectivity after you, you know, entry point, but connectivity into the vehicle safety critical systems are similar. So from that standpoint, it's another uh, entry vector, and however you do to protect the rest of the entry vectors, like cellular or Wi-Fi or everything else, should be similar, not different, because that's the interface to the vehicle or systems at that point. Um, I'll leave it at that and give opportunity for uh, my colleagues here to <laughs> also chime in. But it is a very loaded question, and a lot of research already are planned, and more research will be needed to answer all of that. Yeah, it's it's it's, a, it's an all of the above uh, situation there. I think you know researchers uh, could probably get in a room and debate which is the most imminent or which is the most uh, concerning to them. But uh, you really have to address all of those areas and all of those issues. Um, you know, with the with the vehicle to vehicle. Uh, you know, we want to design it in from the start. I mean, this is going to be something that's going to be, um, uh, you know, government uh, program uh, to put these out, uh, require these units in, in cars, we expect, and, and, and people are going to be relying on that. Um, but they also are going to be relying on, they bring their cell phone in now. Um, and so their data is there, and they want that protected as well. Um, some of this has to do with sort of uh, expectations and understanding, I think, as, as uh, this whole Internet of Things evolves, the public is getting a sense they already are about what the, the risks are, what they can do, um, what they expect to be done for them by the entity that they're dealing with. Um, so, you know, we're using credit cards, we're using mobile phones, we're, we're using, uh, you know, all kinds of communications devices, uh, and they all have uh, advantages that, that people uh, very much uh, appreciate. And I think the connected car is one, um, and, and uh, maybe we spend uh, too much time talking about all the potential problems, um, and sometimes we neglect to talk about all the benefits, um, which we sort of open the conference with. And I don't want to lose sight of that because that's why that's why all this is important because we want to capture those benefits and we want the public to to be uh, see that there's there's a reason why we're doing this. It's not all the bad things; it's all the good things. Is what what uh, uh, what is bringing connected vehicles to market? So may I? Um, yeah. So. I think it's a little bit difficult to prioritize all of the issues to be issues of cybersecurity uh, for automotive. Uh, but uh, I think uh, there, are, there actually uh, there are so many issues to be solved. So um, as I said before, so <coughs> in our activities, we are developing the standards for secure software updating. But uh, actually, there are many other issues to be considered as uh, the security controls. This figure shows many uh, security controls regarding uh, for automotives. Uh, maybe this is not all. Maybe this graph, this figure needs to include uh, security for B2I and security for B2, 
uh, B2B and so on, but uh, at least we have many other issues, uh, including a key management, crypto lightweight cryptography, authentication, firewalls, and so on. In our activities, we just only focus on this one, the, the sec secure software update. But uh, there are many other remaining issues to be considered. So uh, actually, it, it, as the first step, we just only uh, addressing the one of them, <coughs> but uh, we need to consider about many other issues, I think. Well, thank you. Uh, other questions from the, uh, the audience? Just a, just a quick comment from the panel. Isn't there a slight irony in the fact that the V2V -V mandate will instantaneously make cars much more interesting targets than they are right now, which is why there's been so little targeting of cars? It's sort of a, today it's security by obscurity, but if we connect all cars suddenly with, with the same mandated system, suddenly it's much more interesting to hack cars. It's a, it's a little different than that in that, um, you know, the, the V2V is going to be sending out a basic safety message. So it's a lot like adding a sensor, uh, another sensor to the car. Um, so the, the, the information that comes from the sensor, uh, from the V2V connection now, um, will be used like data from another sensor in the car. Um, so I don't know that it's as it's, it's, it, it's major a change. Chem, I don't know if you want to... Yeah. I well, mean, you're introducing a wireless connection to the safety system in the vehicle. Yeah, it's another wireless connection, and we have those already. Uh, it's not necessarily directly to the safety system. It's going to be the information is going to be used um, in the vehicle to make decisions. Uh, like I so said, we have to design security in. I understand what you're saying too, right? It's a, uh, it's an error. It's another entry point. I'm just saying understood that you're raising the bar in, in the implementation, but at the same time, you're making it a much more attractive target. Mm -hmm. And raising the uh, level of creativity you're attracting to the problem is all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's another vector, that's for sure, but that doesn't mean uh, most of the cars today already have, most of them come standard with cellular, uh, you know, long range and short range Bluetooth. In our uh, view of the world, and I'm not on the V2V regulations or research side, I'm generally looking at cybersecurity on a holistic manner. It's another, as uh, Mike said, it's a data point, it's another sensor into the system. It, once you get into that system and how you secure that pathway is part of regulation and how you design the vehicle architecture to protect against that. Now, it is true that there are many pathways already car, and you introduce a, another pathway. By virtue of that, I, I hear you say that you, know, you increase your pathway. That is true, but it's not, a, you know, it's not an incremental. Just because you had a cellular, you add a Bluetooth that didn't double. I mean, it's a, once you have a major pathway, you have to secure uh, safety critical systems. And then that is similar, regardless of how many different pathways you can because they typically come from the same uh, path, and then you, you have to take care of that regardless. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists. Excellent uh, panel, and uh, look forward to following you.